what's the big idea? What are the big ideas that I want to share that are the, the major specials and albums and shows that I tour with in general? And then in between, like, hey, what are what are the jokes that I wrote and I liked and fell through the cracks and didn't make it into the, like the B-sides in a way, but like the B and sometimes people really love the B-sides more than the other ones. <laughs> Welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast. On the show, it's my job to tease out the creative solutions my guests are coming up with to change the world through creativity, social action, and mindset. I also give you tips and techniques so you can do the same. This episode is brought to you by my class, Meditation for Busy People, where you'll learn how to relieve stress and discover clarity and joy in just five minutes a day. It's also brought to you by the Brain FM app and this podcast host, Podbean. Also, follow the podcast on Instagram or TikTok and check out our shop for merch, music, and musings. The links are all in the show notes. Hello, and welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. You are going to love today's episode. We have a returning guest on the show today, comedian Mike Kaplan joins me. Mike has appeared on The Tonight Show, Conan, Letterman, James Corden, Seth Meyers, Comedy Central, Last Comic Standing, and America's Got Talent. He has a one-hour stand-up special on Amazon, which is called Small, Dork, and Handsome, and two podcasts, The Faucet and Broccoli and Ice Cream. His debut album, Vegan Mind Meld, was one of iTunes' top 10 comedy albums of the year, and his 2020 album, a.k.a debuted at number one and was called Invigoratingly Funny by the New York Times. I am so thrilled to welcome you to the show, Mike. Thank you so much for joining me. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I, I loved coming on the show last time. Thank you for having me back. I'm happy to return. And thank you uh, specifically for being able to pronounce the word invigoratingly so uh, like first time <laughs> nailed it. I, I only bring that up because I remember doing a show uh, sometime in the past couple of years, since the album came out, since the New York Times was uh, kind enough to uh, call it that. And so I was proud of that. And I was uh, on a particular show where they asked me what my they'd like my credits to be. And I was like, oh, I, I have this new album. And could you if you, if you don't mind, could you say that the New York Times called it invigoratingly funny? And they said, absolutely. And then they had to do it was like for a taping. And there were so many, I think, a double digit number of takes necessary oh, for no. the host to get <laughs> invigoratingly. Uh, I apologize to any of the crew <laughs> uh, or audience that were there that night at a certain point i was like it, we could change it we but they're like no i'm <laughs> i'm gonna get it so thank you thank you for having me thank you for reading and pronouncing and uh, and everything thank you so much i'm happy to be back <laughs> that's awesome it's like benedict cumberbatch who did a, a huge national geographic special about penguins and could not say the word penguin apparently yeah. that's a he just it was just impossible and and i'm like you're a vegan man you should know how to do that but uh, <laughs> i guess i have higher standards for vegans than non-vegans so i i am so thrilled that you were able before you take off this summer and become a nomad I'm really grateful that you were able to take the time. And I, 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 I stalk you on, on Instagram. I see all your posts. But I, when I saw that, when I saw, hey, we're moving and we're going to become nomads, I went, what? I, let's just jump right in. Can you talk a little bit about what precipitated that? What made you go, you know what? It's time to hit the road. What's going on? Where are you going? Why are you doing it? What's sure. the goal? Thank you very much. Well, first of all, so I've been living with my girlfriend, Rini, uh, for just about, I think this month we've been living together for six years and we met the prior year and began dating. So our relationship is almost seven years old and our living together relationship six and all of that living together has been in the building in Brooklyn that I'm in right now. We lived upstairs. Uh, for a few years and then when this apartment that I'm in now it is the garden apartment it has access to the garden area out back mm. which we moved into in uh, 2019 just uh, I think October November then my girlfriend Rini broke 
her ankle in December, mm. and so it became, which was you know hor horrible. Uh, she was in great pain and couldn't move for uh, several months, and which ended up being a uh, good pandemic practice. But mm -hmm. for the time, for the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. Uh, we were very grateful to have moved to this ground level apartment uh, so For that sure. she could not have to maneuver steps to go to doctor appointments, what have you. Uh, and so this that was a particular like really momentous, you know, experience in our relationship, in our lives. Like I, you know. Have I, as a person who generally travel for a living, I often make uh, most of my living on the road. Uh, for those months, I, you know, uh, canceled a few things, postponed a few things, uh, got used to doing that as well. I'm like, well, this is, you know, my girlfriend needs to be able to uh, eat and uh, and all the other things that she needs to be able to. So this uh this apartment is, you know, uh, our home and a meaningful home and where we've shared like, you know, the bulk of our relationship has taken place in this building. And so about a month ago, we found out from our landlord, who is uh, a nice man, uh, he he thought that he was going to have to like do some overhauling that he could do while we lived here, but found out uh, due to various codes or legal things that he needs to replace the boiler system in our mm. building, which is gas with electric, uh, and that that process will take a year, he wow. estimates. And that during that year, there will be no heat or hot water in the building, and so there can be no tenants living in it. So that that is the main reason why we are, uh, quote unquote, choosing to uh, exit this home uh, for the law and for want of heat and hot water. So we we're here through the end of May is what we are allowed to do. And so we were like, where are we going to go in May or at the end of May in June? Meanwhile, you know, uh, the B story of this uh, tale is uh we already have planned to be in the uk for a month and a half starting in uh july 19th we fly to england and i do some shows there uh at festivals and i'm warming up for the edinburgh fringe fest in scotland where i will perform for almost every day in august i believe it, the festival goes from august 2 through 28 so wow. we will we'll arrive in scotland i think at least august 1st maybe july 31st and leave almost a month later and so already, I mean, our original plan was, well, I guess we have our apartment in New York. We pay rent there because that's our apartment. And then we also pay rent in Scotland because we live there for August. This offered an interesting opportunity, the, the idea that, oh, well, now what if we don't have a new place yet? And I already did also have planned some gigs in California in June. Uh, and I just extended the time and we have friends with guest rooms in California, in L.A. and San Francisco that are very generous and have offered to, you know, some of the some of the gigs I do put me up. You know, some gigs come with a hotel for the night or the week or whatever it is that I'm there. But as it is now, uh, I I made a lot of I had some plans and I expanded some and I made more. I talked to my booking agent. I was like, we're going to what if what if we didn't. What if we were just living on the road uh, in sometimes familiar places where we have friends and family, uh, sometimes in like comedy venues that I've performed at before and are familiar with. So the way it's going to work now is on May 29th, movers will move our stuff into storage, uh, the bulk of it, what we don't need for the next several months. And then we will for about a week uh, stay with uh, a couple friends or family in this area. Then June 8th or June 9th, I think, June 9th to 28th, we'll be in San Francisco and surrounding areas and Los Angeles. I'll be doing a bunch of shows there and we'll be seeing some friends that we love. And it's it's not I feel like I usually take short trips there and try to cram in like the last time I was in L.A. It was for three days and I had mm. like a coffee every two hours on one day. I'm like, friend, wow. meet me here. Now I'll meet you here. Now I'll meet you here. And. <laughs> You know, there's sometimes meetings to take. There's always fun shows to do and podcasts. And now we'll have at least well over a week in L.A. and uh, sort of surrounded by a couple, uh, you know, other chunks in the Bay Area. And so that that's really exciting. We'll return. And then from June 28th through July 6th, we'll 
again live with like my mother lives in New Jersey and she has offered the Kaplan Airbnb uh, ah, yes. as as we wish the the room that was mine in high school <laughs> uh where we're welcome to stay there we have another uh, you know a number we're very grateful that we have a lot of friends who uh, have you know depending like you know my mom also owns a condo in Florida we could live in Miami if we wanted to that's not our plan currently but uh, we're very we're very grateful that we have all these generous uh, loved ones. So for that week, we'll be somewhere. And then on July 6th, uh, we'll drive to the D.C. area where I'll perform for three nights at the Arlington Cinema and Draft House. Then we'll drive to Minneapolis where Rini has an aunt that we'll stay with for a few days, probably. And then I will do uh, July 12 through 15 at one of my favorite comedy clubs in the world, the Acme Comedy Company where I've actually recorded a few albums and just always love being. And then we'll drive back from Minneapolis uh, to the New York area and fly to the UK, where we will live somewhere in England and then somewhere in Scotland for the duration of our time there. Then uh, I think on August 29th, we'll fly back to the States and uh, figure out what's next. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. That is a lot. Uh, I am. That's wow. Okay. So uh, the, the traveling, all of that, it, does it take a toll or are you one of those people who is revved up by, I get to go somewhere new? Thank you for asking. I, I will say three specific things about that, if I can remember them. Number one, I just want to and that I don't mean to gloss over the we're going to just get our stuff into storage because I feel like the bulk of our, you know, uh, there is anxiety. There is concern over like what is going to happen. We have, you know, uh, bookshelf, many Ikea bookshelves full mm. of many, many books. I have already begun uh, the culling process. And oh, yeah. Uh, I've actually started uh, at comedy shows in the past week, bringing some books that I love. And when I'm when I'm selling merchandise after the show, when I'm selling CDs and posters and download codes for my albums, I'm saying, "Hey, I have these books that I love that I I I want to offer. If anyone buys a poster or a CD, take a book." And because I am generous and moving, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and so I feel like it's, uh, you know, a beautiful confluence. My, my girlfriend and I were often like we have a friend, my good, good, dear friend, Zach Sherwin, who is a fantastic comedian and more. He has his life's work that he's on these days is called The Crossword Show. If you can see The Crossword Show, wherever you are, uh, check it out. Zach is uh more much more minimalist in his living than we i think he moved recently and he could move all of his belongings in one car wow. he owns zero books he used to live right next to a library he reads a lot but he doesn't own books and that is we are impressed and inspired and not doing that <laughs> uh, but but i'm i'm getting closer because you know I have amassed so many books over the course of the, you know, my entire life. Some of some of which I've read and want to keep and, you know, because they are meaningful to me. Some of them are by friends of mine. Some of them are, you know, just really impactful. And I'm like, I I will want to reread this. Some of them I do reread. And then I also have masses of books that I do that I have not read yet. Even though I also get books from the library. I keep buying new books and I, I don't think it would be literally possible in the lifetime of a human uh, these days to read every book that I've ever bought and also, you know, keep living and doing all the other things. So I'm being more honest with myself about, you know, do I, I do want on an infinite timeline, on an infinite space line. If there was infinite time and space, I would keep all these books. But Right. In this limited human incarnation, I'm being more <laughs> realistic to be like, okay, this one, I have, I've owned it for seven years. I haven't read it yet. I'm going to put it on my Goodreads, want to read list and sell it, give it away or otherwise, you know, remove it from the physical space of my life. And that has been very freeing and unburdening. Uh, and so I feel good about that. I feel, so I feel like Moving and traveling are different things, I guess, is one of the points uh, that I'll I'll stress to answer uh, your question in general. So like zooming out, this will be 
part two of three, which I don't even remember anymore. But <laughs> uh, I under, you know, quote unquote, ordinary circumstances where we have a home. Uh, I love traveling and I love returning home. I love we it's wonderful to have a home like I do, you know, zooming out even more. I've been learning a lot about Buddhism in the past few years uh, from Instagram and bumper stickers is the joke that I say, but for real from uh, a Buddhist friend and from many books and teachers. And, you know, there is, I think the three main uh, idea, three of the main ideas in Buddhism is often like, this is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. And so that's very valuable. My girlfriend's been reading some books about decluttering, about uh, like she has family who are, you know, various places on the hoarding spectrum. And uh, like we have, and I think our whole culture, you know, like in at least Western culture, the United States, uh, a capitalistic, you know, getting more things is good idea. Like we're, we're all, you know, subject to, the influence of that in some way, perhaps, and maybe not we all, I'll speak for myself. I certainly am. We are in this household. And it feels good to think about like in the Buddhist terms, uh, in Buddhist terms, like I think of this, uh, this Ani DeFranco lyric that I love. Uh, she says, I, my body's on loan. I got it in between my mom and some maggots. And that thinking about that as even like my own body is not something that I'll have forever, like, which doesn't even it's such a weird grammatical thing. Like I won't have my body like who has my body? What is the thing that I think has the body? So like if I don't even have my body forever, surely I don't need all these books. Uh, and so which are the ones that are the most meaningful? Which do I want to literally carry with me? So it's nice to have a home, which is like a construct, literally, physically, but also a construct of an idea. But so when we have that home, I love traveling and it actually feels good because you're kind of like, maybe it's like cosplaying, not having as many belongings. Does that make sense? <laughs> sure. Like, like when Rini and I, like sometimes we fly places and then, you know, we limit our, the belongings that we have for a week or however long we're gone to what fits in our suitcases. Sometimes we like drive, we'll drive to Kansas City where Rini's family lives. And then we'll, we'll have, a, we'll, you know, sort of the way that gas uh, fills the space that it is, like, you know, a balloon, like however big a balloon is, like the gas will expand to fit in the whole balloon and like air will fit a whole room. I feel like our belongings will expand to fit our whole car. Does that make sense? Sure. Like we'll, you know, we're like, oh, we can, we don't have to limit ourselves to just one suitcase and a carry on. We could have, you know, many boxes and bags. Like Rini collects fragrances. She loves having uh, some fragrances with her, some perfumes and colognes and things. And she has uh, a stuffed animal family that will, you know, if we're flying, she'll bring one. If we're driving, she might bring a, a gaggle, you know, uh, a gaggle of stuffies. And so we love we love traveling I, to answer the question yeah, that you asked uh, many eons ago, <laughs> we like traveling does invigorate me and returning home does relax me. Like, I think I am more on the the extroverted end of the spectrum. And maybe this parallel isn't uh, 100 uh, percent aligned with what we're talking about. But, you know, I love. I love a, a gathering of friends. I love interacting. I love doing my comedy job. And then also, if I have friends there, if there are people, if there's a hang, I love hanging. Uh, whereas I understand, you know, people on the more introverted end of the spectrum might be like, I like seeing my friends. And then I like going home and being friends with just myself for a while. And Rini is, I think, uh, at times further along that end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, we... Uh, we, we do our own things sometimes. And when we do things together, like we're, we're aware of that. But I feel like when we're traveling, like she sort of joins me and they're like, well, this is, this is what's happening. So like we're on the road, we're doing our thing. You know, she'll take time to find for herself like and read or rest in the hotel room or somewhere as, as it may be. But yeah, I think the quote that I, I heard a quote recently that like I think it was I think I heard it on the very day that we found out we had to move. And it's by G.K. Chesterton. 
and which I say some people are like, that sounds like a made up name. And so, well, number one, all names are made up names. And uh, if it was made up even more, I would make it up and say J.K. Chesterton. But G.K. Chesterton, uh, he <laughs> said, an adventure is just an inconvenience rightly considered and an inconvenience is just an adventure wrongly considered. And so I am doing my best to contextualize and frame the move and all the traveling that we're going to be doing as an adventure, because I mean, words are <laughs> what we agree that they mean they are. And I, I like that. I really like it. So I, it, under quote unquote, ordinary circumstances where I have a home, love to leave, love to return. And here's the thing. It's sort of like a leap and the net will appear kind of thing regarding where we're going to live in the fall. Uh, it's the spring now and we don't know we're springing off and we don't know where we're going to fall, but I'm confident that we'll live somewhere on earth, probably in the Brooklyn area. I mean, the, the Buddhists say, you know, next lifetime guaranteed next breath, not guaranteed. So any, you know, any living that we're doing, I'm grateful for. It's a bonus. Uh, as the Jews say, Dayenu, you know, it, it's all, I'm very grateful for all the living and traveling and homes. I'm grateful for this home that I have had and still have right now. I have this home. I'm in this home. I'm happy for it. And I'm happy that we have a lot of, you know, that it's a launch pad and that there'll be a lot of like lily pads to bounce off of and figure out where we're going to be eventually. Uh, and also there is, you know, there is some uh, anxiety that I am recontextualizing as excitement. I'm taking a second to sure. synthesize what you just said. I don't call it dead air, you know, on radio, they call it dead oh. air. I call it anticipatory air because mm. it's, I, I, I wanted to understand everything you said. You know, it's, it, it is interesting to me that that process of contextualizing or recontextualizing, it's very personal, but also it's something that the two of you as, as partners, as traveling partners sort of have to agree on, especially since one of you sounds like you're more extroverted and the other one sounds like you're more, she's more introverted. That, that notion of, you know, as I, as I've gotten older, I've kind of gone much more introverted than I used to be, except for that. I think I just didn't know myself well. I think I've always been kind of introverted, but I didn't realize I was introverted that I needed that time. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about with performing and those times when you do want to have a little bit more you time, how do you reconcile your needs in the moment as far as I have to go perform or I get to go perform, I'm doing a get to thing now, I get to mm -hmm. go perform versus actually I need some downtime. How does that work when you're planning out your time and when you're planning out your sense of self, if you will? Sure, thank you. Well, I'll I'll answer in one specific way first and then I'll zoom out. Uh, for So we're re recording in April of 2023 and uh, tonight I'm actually performing the final show I'm performing with a friend of mine that I've done about a dozen shows with this month, uh, the comedian Shane Moss who is a fantastic comedian and a dear friend who started out doing comedy right around when I did uh, about 20 years ago in Boston. And Shane is preparing for a Vegas residency uh, where he'll be doing a show at Area 15. Uh, and it's an, an immersive psychedelic comedy experience with wow. cool like visual art, you know, being DJed live around him. And so I've been this month from April like 2nd through 12, most of those days I was with him uh, opening the show and a couple others since then as well mm -hmm. for like, you know, certainly more than half of the days this month so far. And so I've seen his show, which is called A Better Trip, and it's beautiful and wonderful. And also uh, from April 1 through 12, we were just on the road for the most part together, Rini, me, and Shane. Some days I had my own shows and he did his own thing, but here's here was our tour schedule. Uh, Rini and I drove to Vermont on April 1st. Then we met Shane in Albany the next day. Then we had another show together in Vermont uh, the next day, then New Hampshire, then Maine, then New Hampshire. Then we had 
Rini and I got to be just in Massachusetts for three days, and I had a couple shows there. Then we met up with Shane, went to Rhode Island and Connecticut, and then back to New York. And that was all in the span of, you know, less than two weeks. Uh, almost a different state every day. Mm -hmm. And it was, that is, a, uh, I would not want to do that forever. I would not, like, I like being, I love being somewhere for more than a day. <laughs> um, but this was the schedule and, you know, I knew that it was what it was going to be. And it was really, it's a pleasure to see my friend who doesn't live usually anywhere near me for such an extensive amount of time to get to share these rides where, you know, in the ride, we would talk, we would listen to podcasts, we would listen to music. Sometimes we would ride quietly. But I, I bring this all up in answer to your question, because I remember the when we had the three days to uh to ourselves Rini and me in massachusetts where i was just doing my own shows that i felt a little rundown uh and felt glad and i was like oh am i getting sick is it just i mean my body had been going 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 and i i was grateful to have the time to uh collapse you know mm -hmm. and i remember the first time i had an experience like that was in 2010 i had just uh, been on Last Comic Standing and was now on tour with the top five uh, of the show that season. And we were going out pretty much every weekend and doing four shows in different cities. And they would fly us uh, and drive us around. And so that was nice. But I remember in October of that year, in addition to those four, you know, the, every those 16 shows that they had booked for us, I had a bunch of other travels in between. And I think mm -hmm. I only slept in my bed three nights that month. And on the one hand, I'm super grateful for whenever people want me to do comedy and pay me to do comedy and fly me somewhere to do comedy. I love it. And I'm so happy to do it. And, you know, it was these these times are uh, it, it's few and far between that there's such an intense tour schedule that I find myself afterwards thinking, oh, let's, if that was it all the time, then I would need to say uh, no thank you to a couple of those things in the future. Mm -hmm. Like with, with the future being uncertain with, you know, the job of a comedian as usually akin to a freelancer, you know, we often don't know where our, you know, paycheck is going to be coming from a year from now, six months from now, a month from now. So saying yes to opportunities is, you know, that was that was the way it started. And I'm very grateful to be able to get to a place where I'm like, oh, I don't literally have to say yes to everything uh that comes my way here's here's an analogy i wonder if i shared this with you last time because it comes up every once in a while when i was in edinburgh last time in 2018 which was the first time i was there uh and only so far doing the fringe i had a friend uh named adam who was there for a few days and he's a comedian and also uh, a painter Mm -hmm. And more, and he identifies more as a paint. Painting is his career, and comedy is like a side passion. Mm. Um, and he told me uh, we made plans to hike up uh, Arthur's Seat. I think is like this little mountain that's there. Uh, I say little mountain because I we definitely I think got to the top of it in a half hour. Mm -hmm. And but it it felt it felt good. It was like I'm not a mountain climber, but I was like, oh, we we technically climbed a mountain, and. We had made plans to do it around 2 p.m. on a Friday, I think. And as we were walking and getting, we, this was like the most extensive conversation we'd ever had. Like, we you know, we knew each other from comedy shows, but we really got to know each other and it was really meaningful and beautiful. And part of what he shared was that he had been invited to do a comedy show at 2 p.m. that day as well, but he said no to it because he wanted to come on this hike. He's like, if I was offered a painting gig, I would have taken it because that's my that's my career. But since it was comedy, he's like, I already had this plan and I really wanted to hang out with you and spend this time. So that's why I said no to them. And I contextualized it as like, uh, it seems like you're saying no, but whenever you're saying no to something or someone, you're often saying yes to something else, such as yourself. Or in this case, I call it like saying, you said no to the show, but you said yes to the mountain, you know? Right. And you also said, you know, yes to, so I feel like I, uh to get back to the specific question you asked like i am in ways i'm in many ways fortunate and one of the ways that i'm fortunate is that i 
I do have a lot of energy and a lot of desire to do all of the comedy shows that I want to do, that I that I book myself to do. It's it's rare for me to want to or need to cut back. Like like I said, I think it's you know only two times in the past decades have I ever noted. I'm like maybe my schedule is a little more full of action than I need it to b and like i love like the zen koan like let go or be dragged or you know don't just do something sit there you know these are and like my girlfriend uh rini has been like a, a wonderful uh balance uh to me and and has like really uh helped influence me in positive ways that are helpful to let me like it started out in our relationship you know if i it used to be as a comedian when i was starting out you're like I have to have shows every night or I'm not a comedian. You know, mm. I'm not a real comedian. I'm not a working comedian. And I'm like, okay, a night off a week. And now, you know, the pandemic really uh, shook all that. Like, it was like, okay, I haven't had a show in a year. Am I a comedian? Like, what am I? Who am I? Uh, which is another kind of, you know, identity like uh, that in in the, the Buddhist paradigm. Be like, well, what, what am I? Do I even have a self? No. So... Uh, I love, I love getting to, uh, I love getting to, like the same way that I love traveling and I love returning home. I love going out to do shows and I love returning home. Or if I don't have a show, I love staying home and cooking dinner and having it with Rini and, you know, talking or watching something or reading together. Like I do my best to be grateful for whatever it is, whether it be something or quote unquote nothing, because even the nothings are somethings of a kind like a mountain as compared to a comedy show. And so I, I feel like I, at, another thing that uh, I think comes up is that uh, in our lives together, um, I often wake up earlier than Rini. So I get a lot of usually, you know, quiet time until podcasts start, quiet time in the morning, like mm -hmm. alone time, my time almost every day, like that I'm not traveling, that I'm not, you know, having to get up and fly or get in a car with a friend or whatever it might be. But when I have a home and or if I'm when I'm in a place for a chunk of time, I, I have a morning ritual, a practice of, you know, getting up, uh, you know, brushing my teeth, doing those things. And then uh, usually meditating in bed before I get up and then uh, drinking a liter of water while I read something peaceful and then uh, doing morning pages and just starting writing before then I dive into various, you know, email, social media, whatever I might uh, want to do the work of the day. And so I, and I find that by nighttime when it's usually time to do a show, like I'm, I'm excited. Like I actually like to, I like to get out of the house if it's, especially when it's right now, it's beautiful, getting beautiful and being beautiful and getting beautiful. And there's many kinds of beauty, but the, the warm spring beauty that we see right now, like I live right near Prospect Park. I love when I'm home, when I'm near there to go walk there. Uh, I love going there. I love returning. So uh, I feel like I'm, I'm pretty lucky in that uh, my constitution is such that like I don't have to do a lot of adjusting to uh, have the life uh, the way that I want it. Though also I will share that of course with Rini, with another person who has you know different criteria and different parameters. Like it's uh, valuable and important to like learn what she needs. And like there have been times in our relationship when when she was working uh, a very demanding job that sometimes she would come home at night and want quiet and stillness uh, to the point that I'd be like, well, I guess maybe it will be best we agree that I will, I will, even if I didn't have a show that night, I will go out. I will find somewhere to be to allow her the space uh, and time and peace and quiet that she needs. Uh, and I'm very grateful that, and she loves me. She loves my comedy. Uh, we're both grateful for our love and these things. And also like I have a voice that amplifies. And so we, you know, we do what we can to, you know, she was possibly sleeping when I started doing this podcast. And now I see she has emerged from our room and she, she may go back in there. She may close the door. She may put in, you know, uh, ear loops 
to keep herself in a, as quiet a place as possible. So it's uh, it's oh you know an ongoing uh, discussion and negotiation uh, for each of us you know individually to hopefully know what we need that is best for ourselves and then to communicate that verbally or non-verbally. Uh, and you know if I, if there's a certain uh, day that even if I had a podcast scheduled and she was like, I might need to be quiet today, then I might be like, well, then maybe I'll, I'll do the podcast from somewhere, a different time or a different space. Um, but yeah, I guess we, I, I feel like having her in my life helps me also, you know, ask these questions and answer them for myself. You know, what do I need? Uh, and now she is returning to the bedroom, closing the door, having smiled at me and the things that I said. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm very fortunate that I've been able to make a living, you know, <laughs> expending the energy and, uh, uh, that, that is constantly, I think, you know, churning and flowing through me. Uh, one, one quick fun thing in the past year, Rini and I got these Ura rings, which are like sleep health detectors. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it tells us, you know, how much sleep we've got, how much deep non, you know, non REM REM. And, you know, it tell it measures our temperature and, you know, heart rate, and it'll alert us if you know, like, hey, you maybe you should be getting more or less or this or that. And it'll also during the day, if I like go on a walk, it'll be like, Oh, we detected a workout, a moderate workout. And I found also that when I do comedy shows, and even when I do podcasts, the ring will be like, we sensed that you were doing a moderate workout. And that aligns with a thing that Rini has often said, which is uh, that she believes that my personality burns calories. So <laughs> I, I think that we have confirmation of that from the science of this sleep ring. Um, and I guess that I, this is to say, I mean, I do like like sitting down, lying down, resting, reading, but it's not, I, my natural inclination is to do something more than sit there, which I think is why I gravitate so much towards the don't just do something, sit there. And uh, over the past couple of years, weed edibles have been uh, at, at a sometimes at night helpful tool to incur that encourages me to just lie down and like close my eyes and feel my body and listen to music. And uh, and tell Rini like, man, I really feel my legs and have her say she would say things like you could probably if you just laid down regular like during the day, not high, you might be able to feel your legs also. And I'm like, well, we'll never know. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, yes. it, it, it is interesting how I, I my personality is similar to yours in, in that I love to go out. I love to do things. But there's definitely a time when I'm like, OK, I need to sit for a bit. And yet sitting is it's a practice for me it's not a natural inclination and i i haven't done weed edibles for meditation but maybe i should because there's that would probably deepen my meditation practice or at least it would give me another facet of it but you said something that i'm i'm very i'm curious about and i and i do want to get eventually to talk about edinburgh and i want to get to talk about the new album and all of that but you're you're the things that you're talking about with respect to sort of communication and negotiation with you and your partner is so interesting to me because all of that takes a lot of self-awareness and i'm wondering is it the is it the buddhism study that you're doing or is there some other way that you are deepening the practice of becoming more self-aware thank you for asking that is a good question and i think the answer is both and or all and that like i it's hard to point to one thing and i because I, I don't think it is just one thing but in the past decade uh, I have, you know, begun, like I've, since I, I'm, I'm 44, and I'd say I did mushrooms for the first time when I was about 25 in my mid-20s somewhere. And that was a, a real, there was a real paradigm shift there, like understanding the kind of, you know, thing that a, a plant medicine or a fungus medicine uh, can offer, like to, you know, to the, like, to the meditative space. Uh, uh, and my, my, general like life practices. And then I started doing ayahuasca ceremonies about a decade ago, mm. maybe a little less. Uh, 
And but yeah, sometime almost for the past 10 years, uh, I've done them at least a couple times a year and sometimes numerous more than that. Um, then I start I started meditating in a proper, you know, sort of uh, meditation, like I, I started using meditation apps, I never I would say that I never really meditated before uh, probably also like 2015 2016 i could look and see when i first got headspace the first app that i used and i uh, that was that was another like i feel like these are all kind of like the same way that in in a comedy career sometimes when you hear about somebody who's like a breakout star an overnight success like wow where did this person come from well they probably were somewhere for 20 years working very hard sure. uh before you heard of them and so i feel like the w the way that uh you know the way that i am now which is you know continually like learning and growing as well but you know miles ahead in va in various ways in you know in some, some, I, I, I even hesitate to say, like, I'm so much more self aware than I used to be, because I feel like that would be even that, uh, not necessarily the most self aware. I'm working on it. I'm still working on it. But all of these things, like all of the ingredients that go into making an overnight success for 20 years that, you know, the work beneath the surface, the, the open mics and the time at home writing for a comedian and, you know, all of the emails sent and all of the, pilots written and whatever it might be that nobody gets to see until they you know you make your tonight show debut or have a special or what or release your first album after eight years 10 years 15 years whatever it might be i feel like similarly all of these all of these things the the, the mushrooms the ayahuasca ceremonies the uh the meditation apps which i you know started with headspace tried insight timer like that a lot as well now i use the waking up app uh and then also of course all of the the buddhist teachers and writers and books like i started really like reading and listening to uh Thich Nhat Hanh and mm. uh Pema Chodron who Rini introduced me to i oh, I, I love not, them both I was, oh yeah i had not been familiar and now i believe i've i've certainly read every Pema Chodron book that I could get my hands on every once in a while, I find one that I'm like, is this one that I've read or is it not? Right. Um, and Rini's a big Goodreads advocate. So I, I am doing my best to codify, to, you know, categorize and keep a rep for it, then maybe I'll read it again. But so Rini introduced me to Pema Chodron. She also introduced me to uh, A Course in Miracles. Rini introduced me to numerous spiritual teachers and texts there is a poet named mark nepo uh who i love uh who writes these beautiful essays and just books full of meaningful uh life lessons uh i don't know if i already mentioned did you hear me say byron katie no i did uh, not so i've been she introduced me to byron katie and i love i love her so much i'm reading right now uh, her book, uh, A Mind at Home with Itself, I believe it's called. Mm. And I listen, I just listened to her on Pete Holmes's podcast. And it's, I mean, I just, I love her. I love her work so much. It really helps. Like, it's so funny. I think, you know, for, for the listener, there was a brief technical glitch that made uh, Isolde and I uh, not be hearing each other. And during that time, I was continuing to talk and it was not recorded. And I was like, the most beautiful thing that I love about Byron Katie's work is that I can just pick it up and I read, I try to read a little bit of it every day. And when, even if I feel like I'm, you know, flustered or, you know, kind of running uh, emotionally amok or anything, uh, I feel like reading even just like one passage of her writing can really center me and bring me, bring me back to presence and be in the moment where I am right here. I was like, hello? Hello. I was like, oh, I guess I'm just here alone in this moment. Uh, great. Exactly where I've always been and where where we always each individually are. But so those all of those like teachers, books uh, and sort of just different, I think, spiritual paradigms. Uh, it's so funny. I remember in the most recent book, I, I think one of the most recent books I've been reading of Byron Katie's, somebody asks her, why don't you you don't use the word spirit or soul? Uh, she uses like the word mind, for example, in a place where other people might and that she's, yeah, why don't you use spirit or soul? And Byron Katie's like, because I don't really know what those mean. I was like, that's 
fun and fascinating and uh and i dig it it resonates so those those are things that you know each of those you know teachings each of those books each of those people are they're like a world you know that you could go deeper and deeper and like listen to them all on different podcasts and like read all of their books and like each one opens up you know whole new worlds and you learn about other ones like i love that i've you know discovered the teachings of uh jack cornfield and joseph goldstein and sylvia borstein and you know all these people who are you know in the space of uh like you know in the buddhist uh paradigm you know trying to help help everyone uh you know to gain happiness and eliminate suffering uh and like ramdas i came across at a, at a certain point of course as well and then also you know all of the the wonderful comedians i think i mentioned i, I met pete holmes uh you know who i listened to byron katie on the podcast of like he has numerous other you know uh guests and people in his uh circles and my father even uh introduced me to the the i think he's a a priest or a some sort of you know a christian uh figure uh richard Rohr, uh who i like we listened to on Brene Brown's podcast, Brene Brown, who I also was introduced to by Rini. So all of this happening, you know, in the past decade, I feel like there's there was like for me a renaissance of discovery or a naissance of discovery of of all of these teachers and teachings and ideas. Uh, and, you know, so many like, you know, even just the simplest like Thich Nhat Hanh idea of like that. I think it's in his book, uh, How to Fight, maybe or. Uh, he has like all these little ones, how to eat, how to talk, how to rest, how to, how to this, how to that. And in one of them, it was about like, you know, that there's, you know, you, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the, uh, often quoted as like a native American tale of like the two wolves inside everyone. Oh, uh, sure. Mm -hmm. And you know, which, which one will win between the, the, the fear one and the love one, the one you feed. And like in Thich Nhat Hanh's paradigm, it's about, uh, he often uses the metaphor of like watering seeds, you know, that we all have the seeds of, of joy and compassion and forgiveness and love within us, as well as the seeds potentially of anger and fear and distrust and insecurity. And that, you know, will these feelings might exist within us and then we can, you know, tend the garden of the ones that we want to continue to grow within us. So even just that as a metaphor, was, you know, at the first time I heard it, like mind opening, you know, mind blowing, heart blowing. Uh, and, and so like Rini was, you know, an entry point for so many of these, uh, you know, just this very way, the desire of, of exploring, uh, you know, these, these paradigms, which is really, I mean, ultimately, you know, all fingers pointing back at the, the self or the non-self or like, you know, I think Ramdas has said like something like the the only the best thing that I can do for anyone else is work on myself. And uh and there's another I forget where this comes from but Rini shared it with me like that the best way, you know, perhaps to live a spiritual life is to concern yourselves with other with your own soul and other people's stomachs. And you know, so I've also in the past years been getting more into uh, different activist circles as well, like you know, with regard to you know political text banking or phone banking or you know going to rallies and protests and you know uh, being present in ways you know contributing time, dollars, attention, and you know amplifying voices in that space. Uh, and so I feel like. Uh, I forget what the exact question was, but it's, I mean, I think it's all of these things. It's that I, I, I didn't even, you know, I didn't, I, I wasn't raised with, uh, I was raised, you know, sort of secularly Jewish, you know, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, and, and I do think that my, my family definitely did, you know, highlight, I feel like, you know, the Dalai Lama says, you know, his real, like, you know, I, I think what's the quote that I like, it's, uh, you know, be kind whenever possible, it is always possible, and that his religion is kindness, and that resonates with me. And I think that that was, that was uh, shared not explicitly in that language in my family as I was growing up, but that was like the thing, like I am, you know, these days I've been, you know, vegan for over 20 years, and vegetarian a few before that, and it's funny because when I was a kid, 
like I loved, you know, Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat and like, you know, violent video games. And I like I still like dumb action movies. I like, you know, I, I can watch. I love a, a John Wick movie because it's kind of like a beautiful dance of, you know, this violent cartoonish thing that I would wish didn't exist in real life, you know. And but as a kid, my mom didn't allow me to have uh, even a fake gun of any kind. No water guns, no G.I. Joes with guns, no, even I got a Nintendo, the first Nintendo, which came with the game Duck Hunt. And my mom uh, got rid of the the zapper by which, you know, you, you shoot things in the game Duck Hunt. So for me, the game was just Duck Watch. <laughs> and and it's I was like, you know, upset about it as a kid because I was like, well, I don't think that having a fake gun is going to make me you know, want to have a real gun. Like, I don't want to have a real gun. But my mom was just like, well, this is this is the rule in the house. And like now as an adult, like I don't have kids, but I wonder uh, how I would raise them. Like I do. I would definitely raise them to not want to uh, use real guns uh, to hurt people uh, or animals or any, you know. And so I'm like, oh, yeah, I've sort of come come around to where where my parents were uh, when I was a kid. So I think the seeds were planted even at, at, at that time in my, in my, and then probably you go back, you can keep going back, you know? Uh, so I feel like it all started with the big bang and eventually <laughs> I was born and my parents uh, raised me in this, you know, kind, loving way uh, that I'm very grateful for. And then uh, I'm grateful to have, to, to have discovered Rini, to have met Rini, to get to be alive and share, uh, in, you know, in the life practice that we do and all the things that I said. But yeah, I do think that Rini has also done a lot of reading and learning about, uh, like there's a different, different writers about relationships, about uh, like she has, uh, you know, in the, I guess, broadly in the self-help uh, genre, she has read a lot and explored a lot and, uh, you know, sort of is like an investigative scientist of her own self and the things that are interesting to her like she's read about you know abusive relationships and we've talked about those and we we watch like shows like love is blind and married at first sight as kind of like ooh, what is i uh, we wouldn't make the same choices uh even to go on a show like that but they often i mean it's entertaining and also uh kind of eye-opening to be like we can look at that and be like well Clearly, there's a lot of alcohol on those shows. So that we actually stopped drinking uh, for the most part several years ago uh, because we found that alcohol, uh, we're, we're big fans of direct communication and alcohol is something that for us in our experience uh, obscured our capacity for that direct, uh, you know, caring, kind, compassionate communication. And, uh, and so we, you know, we can see in the lives of others, we're like, oh, like, what do, what do we like about our relationship? How do we want to be? How do we want to be as individuals? How do we want to be as a couple, as a collective? And, uh, and so, yeah, I think we, we both agree. Like one thing she discovered for herself over the past few years, she did a lot of reading and learning about the autism spectrum and how often women and girls go undiagnosed or are diagnosed much later if they're diagnosed at all because of the different ways that uh, that autism can manifest. And so she essentially self-diagnosed and she's like, there is a way in which like, I think we both like I, neither of us have an official diagnosis, but we also we love the show, love on the spectrum and relate to the characters in many ways. We love, uh, like there are, you know, there are many, I, I've over the years written jokes about the autism spectrum that people who are on the spectrum or are friends or loved ones of, or have worked with people on the spectrum have said like, these are, you know, these are jokes that resonate and they appreciate. And so I feel like there is, you know, they say that if you, if you meet one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, but something that we have uh, found in our own experience and in the experience uh, that I've seen others talk about is sometimes communicating directly is like the best way to do things uh, in a world or in a society where often there are, you know, there are things that for some people are unspoken. And when sometimes, sometimes when things are unspoken and people both agree, then great, you got it, you're fine. But sometimes if things are unspoken, one person might think it means one thing and one person might think it means another thing. So I feel like that is one of the, one of the tools of our relationship is to actively, you know, communicate 
directly, uh, you know, to the point beyond the point where other people might be like, I get it, you know? And so I feel like my comedy and my style and my thinking sort of lend itself to that very much. Like a joke that I say sometimes is that I, uh, I, I, I say everything that I think and Rini thinks everything that she says. Um, but this is something that, you know, we, that is really valuable, uh, for us because even the, this, uh, I'll, I'll leave you with this for this topic. Uh, (laughs) The the very first conversation that I remember having with her, which is the very third conversation she remembers having with me that we met twice before the real big conversation that we had that began our relationship. Uh, we were talking for hours after a comedy show and really having a very nice time and vibing, uh, perhaps for, for people who use words like vibing, which I guess I am now. Um, and it seemed really, really nice and beautiful and meaningful and flirtatious in a way that seemed clear and unspoken uh, until I like I think I put my my hand either on her hand or on her arm, and I and I and it seemed like that was an okay thing to do. And then I also said, I'm like, just want to make sure that you know, like my hand is on your hand or your arm right now, and that that's okay, and that you're you're good with that. And uh, if you're not, then I'll take it away. And she's like, I am good with it. And that she appreciated my se- my doing it and my saying it. Uh, and so that like, just even from the very beginning of our relationship, that seed was planted. And I think that kind of explicit communication where you don't leave things to chance clears up a lot of potential misconceptions and misunderstandings. To me, you know, my husband and I, this this is a thing we struggle with, if you will. And now we're, I, I sound a little bit like, like we're on some sort of a self-help talk show, but there is something to be said for that sort of very, and explicit is the word that keeps coming to mind, very explicit communication that you do talk things out in that way and more power to you both. I think that's that's amazing that, that you are consciously doing that. If it's okay, though, because I I could keep you here for the next six hours, Mike, this is so fascinating, but I know you have a day to get back to, as do I. So I would love to shift gears a little bit and go way back to something you said earlier. And Please. and that is the Fringe Festival, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. You mentioned it a couple of times that you've been there before and then you're taking a show this August during your nomadic phase or during mm-hmm. part of your nomadic phase. Can you talk a little bit about what the process is to get into the French festival because I'm not terribly familiar with all of that and also what what is the what is the process for you of doing it because you said it's something like a show every day for a month and then what does and this is a non-buddhist thing but what will success look like for you at the end of that very arduous and intense and yet also hopefully fantastic time Sure. Thank you for asking. And, you know, it's not actually as big a gear shift as you might think, because the show that I'm bringing is actually essentially all about my relationship with Rini. Ah. So uh, and that she is a co-creator of and a co-shaper and director and contributor to um, as as is you know our relationship. And, you know, my comedy is, quote unquote, mine. But also this show more than any other is ours. Wonderful. Um, and so for there, there, the process for me to bring my show there, uh, and is there's different ways to bring a show there. There's, uh, the first time I went in 2018, uh, I told, I had told my manager, uh, that I was thinking of going and I knew that he had, and I asked him, how do we do it? Because I knew he had clients who had gone before. And so he I did some outreach and, you know, magic managerial things to uh, get us a producer from the UK. Uh, and that producer essentially, you know, they knew uh, basically I knew a guy who knew a guy. Um, and that's <laughs> essentially what we're doing this time as well. In fact, I wanted to go back in 2020, uh, but the pandemic uh, made that impossible. Then in 2021, I think they had a small version of the fest. And uh, so I was like, okay, well, let's try to go back in 2022. But I think in 2022, they already, they didn't have as many slots and they had were filling them with people who were already planning on coming the year before, but couldn't. 
there were an assortment of things. So uh, one, here's how you get to do the Fringe Fest in 2023 is plan to do it in 2020 and then try <laughs> to do it in 2021 and 22. But uh, so if you are, you know, if you are a comedian, if you are, you know, a person who has a show that you want to bring there, uh, if you know other folks who've been there, you can talk to them and like, I can, you know, I could potentially put people in, be like, hey, here's the the companies that I know. Here's the producers, the production organizations that I know that have brought shows there before. You could, and they could potentially, depending on when it, I think like probably uh, the time to like start trying to get a show to the fringe for like next year would be right after the, the fringe ends this year or mm, sometime mm -hmm. in like the end of the calendar year heading into the calendar year of the fringe that you want to go to. Uh, that said, also, there's a another much more uh, like accessible way that I haven't done, but I know friends that have done as well. Uh, and some people find great success with this, which is just called the free fringe. Like there's the show that I'm doing, like there's a ticket price and, you know, the production company, they make their money. And hopefully if enough people uh, come, then we then there's some then I don't lose a lot of money. Uh, but uh essentially there it's a it's a massive you know it's a massive machine and if you want to avoid that massive machinery you can the free fringe is i don't know who operates it but you could just search you know free fringe edinburgh and you'll find a way to just submit to that and if you submit to that early enough i think there's just venues all over the city you know like theaters and classrooms and bars and restaurants and uh, I, there was one like a spare room in the basement of a health food store that I, I saw a show in that was fantastic. And just the whole city becomes, you know, a festival full of venues. And wow. so, yeah, I would say, you know, if you're thinking of bringing a show there for the first time, like definitely look into the free fringe because it is, it, you know, it, you don't have to pay a producer. You know, you'll have to pay minimal, you know, sort of costs and fees and things, I'm sure. And you have to get yourself there and put yourself up and pot potentially, you know, hire promotion if you want to do that or get ready to do a lot of promotion and flyering and putting thing, you know, getting the word out yourself. Uh, but for me, I'm very grateful to have the machine. Uh, right. And like I'm, you know, hiring a, a UK based PR person who has experience, you know. Uh, getting reviewers to the show, getting, you know, my my name and face out there and getting interviews done uh, or get, you know, getting booked to be in magazines and on podcasts and whatever it might be, because it's like, you know, a whole a whole different country, a whole different experience, a whole even though I've been there once. I'm like, uh, I'm sure, you know, just because if you go to one fr one Edinburgh Fringe Fest, you've probably gone to one Edinburgh Fringe Fest. And so I. Having gone in 2018, uh, the the thing that I hope for, uh, essentially the the plan, the the thing that I loved about doing it in 2018 was, I eventually like I did the show I think 25 you know 25 days in a row approximately, and the show was called All Killing Aside, and that is the hour of comedy that then became my last album, AKA, uh, that I recorded the following spring, and doing the show that many times in that environment in front of all these different audiences full of people from all around the world was like very was a wonderful workout for the show like it was i was the show was ready i could have recorded it before i went but it sort of made it more like lean and muscular and really you know locked into place the way that it went and it was very helpful to have Rini there and watching the show nearly every night and uh, offering notes of like hey you said this one way this night and this way another night and uh, she's like i prefer this be for these reasons and this doesn't actually make sense the way you say it even though they laugh so what if you said it like this instead or in addition and you know so we we worked together and like she offered like great notes on like physicality at certain points in the show which is something that i don't always think about uh because i'm thinking about like you know the the words the the function and she she often she's big it, she loves dance and movement and thinks kinesthetically often more than i do and so she's a wonderful partner to have in that way uh and so the show became you know the the hour like the i feel like the optimal version of itself and so that is the hope that i have for bringing this show there this year. It's again, it's in a shape that I would be thrilled to record tomorrow, but I also am still making discoveries. And so I'm happy to bring it through there 
uh, uh, and put it, you know, give it the the Edinburgh treatment, and then ultimately, uh, at some point after uh, the festival, to record it as a special and, you know, release it to the world. You know, it's interesting. In listening to you, I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, and the yeah, yeah, yeah part of it is, first of all, congratulations. And second of all, I love the fact that you are comfortable with thinking, you know what, this could go up right now. And yet I can see about getting it what you called leaner and, and more muscular. And when that has to happen, what do you do to make sure that something you've probably practiced and rehearsed a uh, hundred times, I don't know how many times you rehearse your sets, how do you embrace and embody these changes to make sure that you're making the changes you actually wanted to make? Uh, thank you for asking. I mean, the the wonderful thing about stand-up is that, you know, I feel like the the doing it is the thing. Like the the record of it, the special, the album, the recording, like that is like I'm thrilled to get to do that so that, you know, people who who can't get to where the show is. You know, there's billions of people around the world and there are, you know, I know I don't know what the exact numbers are, but I I know that, you know, millions like like my Spotify tracks have been listened to millions of times, which is a, an order greater than like the I've never had a million people at a live show. Sure. Uh you know, I've, wouldn't uh, that be the, cool though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't. It's hard to even imagine. I'm sure that's. I mean, some of them would have to be watching it on a screen, and there, there have been millions of people watching me on screens. But uh, the the beautiful thing about stand up is that, like, you know, I can tonight try it one way, and tomorrow try it another way, and I can do that over and over, and I do do that, you know, over and over, dozens of times, hundreds of times, perhaps even thousands of times. Like, uh. I mean, I'm, I don't, I actually don't know how many times I've done this specific show, but certainly I, th I think hundreds, I mean, mm -hmm. at I think in a three digit number order and, and ha especially having, you know, a partner who has seen so many incarnations of it as well, as well as myself, as well as having the various recordings going back, you know, several years to the earlier incarnations of the show that contain some jokes that don't even end up in the, the you know, the, the ultimate version of it. Um, and, but yeah, so I feel like that's a beautiful, uh, an opportunity that I have to like the, uh, you know, the pandemic was a kind of a, you know, obviously uh, horrendous in many ways, you know, many lives lost, many lives impacted, careers impacted, health impacted, and also uh, the one, one bit of light that I have experienced from it is like that I didn't do that, I didn't do this show for a year or more, a year right. and a half, I think, and I, I had to relearn it. And mm. like, so I went back and listened to and watched old versions of it. And I was like, oh, right. And I had to like basically put on my own past self as a costume and be like, yes, of course, this part, that part. And remember it like I was, you know, relearning a song that I knew as a kid, mm. uh, a song that I had written. And in so doing, like new things arose. And then some things I'm like, oh, I, that part, I don't even need that part for this anymore. So that can go into a different thing, which uh, I think will potentially segue nicely into perhaps our final topic. But I I feel like that that process by which I, I was great to know that I could relearn it, that I, you know, that it wasn't starting from scratch, that uh, and that it, it actually did come back stronger, that I was able to be like, well, what what is this show? Because I, I had, you know, all these ingredients and now I'm like, oh, yeah, this is this is the meal. It has to, it starts like this. It ends like this. These are the important beats that I, I get to along the way. This is the order that it goes. There's still like there's still a few moving parts, a, few, a little wiggle room where I'm like, uh, maybe I, I, I don't have some things. I say the exact same every time. Some things I still just get the idea across a different way each time until up until the point of it's being recorded. Maybe I'll record, you know, I'll, I'll record four different sets and pick the one that I'm like, well, that part, I guess that's how that one goes now. Uh, and ultimately, like, 
you know, I or we, Rini and I are the ultimate authority on what this show is and how it goes because there's, you know, we don't have to submit it to anyone. We don't have to get anybody's approval. There's no certification. There's no authority uh, greater than ourselves regarding this show. So ultimately it's uh, what do we, what do we like? What do we want? What do we, what do we want it to say? How do we want it to sound and look? And, uh, and so, yeah, I think that that's, uh, that, I think that's the answer. And, and it's a, and it's a great answer. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I teach people how to write. And when I write my own books, I write the book, I immediately set it aside for at least a month and I don't think about it. I don't. And then when I come back a month later, all of a sudden I'm looking at it with the eyes of someone who wasn't the person who wrote it. And it allows me to see the whole thing a lot better. And I'm wondering if, if your show is like that too. Uh, but I'm not asking that question because I know time is a wasting. And mm -hmm. I wanted to, I did want to ask you about, you You had kind of a circuitous route to getting live in between albums out into the world. Would you talk about uh, that a little bit about what it is and the process that that you went through to bring it out to us? Sure, thank you. So in so here's a brief history of my uh, life experience in comedy is uh, I started doing comedy in about 2002 and in 2010 I released my first stand-up album called Vegan Mind Meld which uh, essentially was all of the best jokes that mm -hmm. all the jokes that the audience laughed at the most over the past seven eight years uh, and you know it wasn't a one-person show it was you know there were some some themes that arose, like some things that I talked about extensively, but a lot of it was just like jokes in a very specific order so that I could remember them and share them. And then a couple years later, I, I think in two years later, I recorded Meet Robot, uh, which was my second uh, my second album, which was basically all the best jokes that I weren't that I wrote since then that hadn't been included <laughs> on the first one. Uh, and then 2014, my first one hour special, Small Dork and Handsome, uh, came out on Netflix first, now on Amazon. And it was the first hour that it was still just a, a lot of jokes that I loved, like my favorite jokes my that I and my best jokes that I'd written since the last albums. It was the first time that I sort of structured it in a way, structured the hour in a way where there was like a time travel like element in the final joke. And so I started the show by saying, in conclusion, a joke about time travel, but first the rest of this. Mm. And and there were a few other moments throughout the show where there were kind of like, you know, digressions and like uh, discoveries of like returning to what had been expressed earlier, which is now something that I feel like is uh, a constant uh, part of my, uh, my comedy experience. The thing that I love doing is to, you know, I, I guess actually kind of I'll connect this back to I love traveling and I love returning. I love uh, I love traveling physically away from my home. I love returning to my home. I love digressing far from a point and then returning to the very point uh, after it seems like, you know, a, a, a long, long time uh, has gone. It's just it's a fun. I feel like returning to a thing that the audience like might have thought was gone forever. Uh, it's like a beautiful memory surfacing. Mm. And so that. That special was, I think, the first time that I was playing in that in that space in that way. Then in 2016, I recorded an album called No Kidding, which was uh, the first album that was themed uh, topic wise, uh, not just structurally, but uh, the theme was that I don't want children. And I had been dating a woman who wanted children and we loved each other very much, but we found this to be an incom incompatibility. And but because of that, it was uh, the cause of a lot of, you know, inner struggle and thought. And I, I ended up writing a lot of jokes about the topic. And I found myself thinking like, oh, what if I could make this whole show kind of springing from this topic? Mm. And so I, I was, I'd never thought that I could, I never, never wanted to, never had the idea, like people like Mike Birbiglia is a comedian who I love, whose first album was full of jokes to drink Mike. And then after that, he's been essentially just doing beautiful one man shows full of jokes uh, for the last, you know, more than a probably decade or two now. And 
uh, people would ask me sometimes, like, do you want to do something like what he does? And I'm like, I can't even imagine doing things like he does. I'm just going to keep doing things like I do. And I'm grateful that the way that I do things has grown and evolved to at least I'm, I'm still not doing the kind of one man show that he is doing. But I was like, I'm glad that I was a, I, I conceived of I conceived of an album where I talk about how I don't want to conceive of children. Um, <laughs> And I like conceiving of them. That's fine. Love children. Rini has uh, many uh, younger siblings. They're delightful. I love I love children. I don't want to specifically create any. Mm -hmm. And so that's what that album was about. In 2020, the album AKA came, uh, came out. And AKA, as I said, is short for uh, All Killing Aside. And the theme of that album was uh, love, compassion, and not murdering. Mm. And uh, so that was... Uh, that was actually an idea that was born in an ayahuasca ceremony. I thought, I'm like, what if I could do an album that was all about kindness, what, an hour of comedy all about love in this way? Uh, and I ended up talking about ayahuasca in it a fair amount as well. And so that, so no kidding in 2016 and uh, AKA in 2020, a funny thing, I realized the theme of the first one, I don't want to make any more people. And the theme of the second one, I don't want there to be any fewer people. Like, no, <laughs> no kids, no murder. Um, yeah, in the meantime... evens out somehow. Yeah, I think so. Uh, in the meantime, I still write all the jokes that I've been writing, and I'm not only writing jokes to these themes. Like, things happen in my life that are fun and weird, and I jot them down, and I say them, and I try them on stage. And so in the intervening years between 2016 and 2020, I still had lots of jokes that I had written that didn't fit either theme. And so I said, I was like, why don't I, I still want to, I want to record these. And so I just had the idea to record it and call it live in between albums, because I, uh, the idea was I'm like, well, I have uh, these themed albums, but I also want to share just these these fun, uh, you know, little little snowflakes of ideas that make me laugh and make other audience uh, make audiences laugh. Yeah, I'm my own audience as well. Make me and other audiences laugh. And so in 2017, uh, I recorded this just one show that that became this album at a place called Great Scott in Boston, which sadly closed during the pandemic. My friend Rob Crean, a wonderful Boston comedian, booked me on that show many times. It happened every Friday for, I think, several years. And I would go every, a couple times a year and just have fun on that show. And so I recorded that album. And then in 2018, my friend Dominic Del Benny, who uh, has a comedy record label called Blonde Medicine, and he's been a friend who I've known for a long time, and um, he produced uh, AKA, uh, Blonde Medicine produced that album. And I told him that I had this hour of comedy that I just recorded on my own that was uh, just full of fun jokes and also happened to be clean. Like all the jokes were, you know, uh, family friendly. Uh, not not necessarily by design, but I also was aware that that satellite radio, there's a, a station called Laugh USA that plays clean comedy and that there because there's less clean comedy than there is all comedy, that if you have a clean comedy album or clean comedy tracks, like they might be more likely to play it more. And so uh, Dominic helped me uh, like produce that album in a way that we're like, let's just give it to satellite radio only. Uh, because we figured if we gave it to them exclusively, maybe that would be an incentive for them to play it even more. Uh, like this is the only place that it exists. So from 2018 until now, until this past month, uh, that was the only place that you could hear live in between albums. And a lot of people like over the years were like, hey, I heard this track. Where can I get it? I'm like, you you can get it the only place that you heard it. You just have to have to hear it. But one of the reasons that we released it now is that uh, it's in the past five years, I found myself with more jokes that I knew what to do with that didn't fit in this new show or the last show or the one before. Mm. And so in August of 2022, I recorded live in between albums two, Rocky Mountain <laughs> High in Denver. Uh, and so that and now that album is playing exclusively on satellite radio. And we've, you know, like the same way that sort of on the Tonight Show, you know, the first guest moves down to the couch and this as the next guest uh, joins the conversation. This uh, as this album is now the one that plays uh, only on satellite radio. We're like, let's release this now, you know, five year old album. Uh, technically, uh, to the masses who mostly haven't been able to hear it. And so that is why in March of 2023, 
uh, this 2018 album has been added to Spotify and Apple Music and anywhere else that you can generally find comedy or music albums. And I'm, it's just really fun and I, I love it and I'm happy for, it's like, you know, I don't have children. I'm not planning on having children, but these albums are my children and I'm excited for everyone to be able to interact and engage with this child, my album, live in between albums. Oh, and just last, I don't, I don't know if it's an interlude, if it's last, but a postlude, <laughs> um, the, the live in between albums two, the one that I just recorded last year has on it some tracks, some jokes that were originally a part of the show that I'm bringing to Edinburgh this year that I realized I'm like these, like the show's already, it could go an hour and a half, but in Edinburgh, it has to be under an hour. Ah. And uh, so part of that, you know, making it leaner <laughs> uh, is like, what, which jokes actually need to be here? Which jokes are actually a part of the story of this show? And like, so there's tr a couple tracks uh, on, on this particular album, uh, the new Live In Between Albums 2. Like one of them is called something like Dreidels Something and Dharma. I forget. Oh, dr Dishes, Dreidels and Dharma. And because it was a, I talk a lot about being Jewish in the new show. And there was a joke about dreidels. And I'm like, yeah, while I'm, while I'm on the subject. But I'm like, well, there's, there's already enough. It's more than plentiful. So that this, uh, this joke can now live here. And so I feel like this is like a really fun new process that I've discovered for myself where I can kind of, you know, in some ways artificially, but in some ways naturally alternate between like, what are, what's the big, what are the big, what's the big idea? What are the big ideas that I want to share uh, that are the, the major specials and albums and shows that I tour with in general? Uh, and then in between, like, hey, what are, what are the jokes that I wrote and I liked and fell through the cracks and didn't make it into, the, like, the B-sides in a way. But, like, the B, and sometimes people really love the B-sides more than the other ones. Like, because sure. com comedy doesn't have to be just, you know, uh, one-person shows or a themed concept. Like, some, and, and uh, in America, a lot of the comedy is just a bunch of jokes. So if you're like, hey, why, why'd you start telling... Uh, why'd you start having themes? Like, well, listen to these albums. You don't have to listen to any of the themes. Like, I think I think you can enjoy all of the albums. But uh, but yeah, that is that is the story of live in between albums. I love the fact that your that your current set of albums are tonight show guests. That makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> That's you. great. Uh, yeah, and and I'm looking forward. I actually have not listened to live in between albums. I have a sort of a backlog of things mm -hmm. of things that I'm listening to, but I'm very excited to head to Spotify and check it out. I am, I know you have to go. I know I have to go. Mike, I'm so, so grateful that you took the time to be here. And I'm glad we got to do this before you went on your huge, fun roller coaster nomadic journey this summer. <laughs> uh, I, I did want to, I did want to ask if you wouldn't mind before we, before we move off and the rest of our day, can you tell me so that because I, I know people learn differently, some people like seeing it, some people like hearing it. Somebody wants to find you. Where do they find you? Thank you so much. That is very generous. Well, to find me, my physical person body, uh, <laughs> of course, uh, it will be nomadic or uh, nomad or yes, glad. Um, but <laughs> my so my name. Uh, Mike Kaplan is spelled in the weird way as such, M-Y-Q-K-A-P-L-A-N. If you go to MikeKaplan.com, I usually have my tour dates there. Uh, and I also uh, am at Mike Kaplan on most of your major social media. And so often on Instagram, people will post if I'm doing shows in New York. Like, I don't put all of my New York shows individually on my website, but they're very often, if you search for me on Instagram, you'll find what shows I'm doing about town, but uh, another great way to find me. Oh, also, there's a new social media associated with Substack, uh, which I don't know if you've gotten into, but I really, I have a Substack newsletter that I also recommend uh, people if you want to receive one message from me a week, uh, one email that is full of a few jokes and some thoughts, and then also my tour dates. Uh, I would love for you to check that out. That is at mikekaplan.substack.com. And Substack also has a new Twitter-like social media feed called Notes. So you can follow me there as well. 
Uh, I'll post jokes and thoughts and nice things and fun things and ideas there. But so yeah, Substack is a great place to uh, find out what I'm doing. Uh, any social media that you love. Uh, I, of course, have a bunch of comedy albums that are on all of the places that albums might be. Spotify, Amazon, Apple Music, whatever major evil corporation you wish to support. Uh, <laughs> you can stream, you can download some of them. There are physical copies. Like if you go to blondemedicine.com, you can get a physical copy of AKA if you wish and not support any of those massive giants. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that the, oh, my podcasts, of course, are called Broccoli and Ice Cream and The Faucet, as you mentioned. And I'd love to have you as a guest on Broccoli and Ice Cream uh, at a at a future point that where I am still enough that we can make it happen. I'd uh, love that. A hundred percent. That would be wonderful. Uh, but yeah, so if you're a podcast listener, then that's there. I know sometimes people, uh, like I do post clips and short videos on social media as well. And there are some longer clips on YouTube and my special, of course, my hour special is on Amazon. But I do think, you know, if you're like only, if you only do one thing, listen to my albums because, or come see me do live shows, uh, come to Edinburgh. If you only do one thing, do a thousand things. Uh, <laughs> have the one thing be wish for infinite wishes and then do all of these things. But I am a, I, first and foremost as a career, as a passion, I am a stand up comedian and I'm very proud of all of the albums that I have created. Uh, certainly, especially uh, they're all of my children, but uh, unlike uh, I, maybe it is like with children. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if this analogy will hold, but, you know, maybe parents <laughs> do parents get to be better parents with each child. Uh, yes, they do. Well, then uh, <laughs> I'm just going to answer that. Why not? <laughs> check out my most recent uh, comedy children, which are AKA live in between and live in between albums. Uh, and then, yeah. And follow me on the writing places, Substack and social media to get, uh, any writing, uh, joke, fun thing fixes that you'd like to get as well. And, oh, one, one final postlude. I'm, I did some voice acting in a podcast called Intra Quest. And I believe that whole season, the first season is maybe 10 episodes exists. Uh, all the places that your podcasts might be and uh, yeah and oh yeah and my feel free uh, if you if you're like but I have a lot of extra money also then support me on Patreon and you'll gain even bonus podcasts because for my broccoli and ice cream podcast I have two conversations with each guest one focusing on the work of their life one focusing on their joys and I release one for free and one is behind the Patreon paywall so uh, thank you for your generosity uh isolda of of spirit of offering of having me here and thank you uh listeners for all your generosity of receiving uh the massive download of words that i just uh released into you now i have to go rest for one second <laughs> don't go don't go mike don't go yeah, i'm here uh, uh wow take a breath though <laughs> Uh, uh, first of all, I'll put all of the links to all of that stuff in the show notes so you can access that there as well as having heard Mike say it. Mike, thank you for doing that. I don't know if you remember, but I have a silly little question that I ask people at the end of every episode. And it's, as I said, it's silly, but I find that it yields some profound answers. And the question before you leave is this. If you had an airplane, environmentally friendly, of course, that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Ah, uh. I don't remember this question if it's the question that if it's the same question you asked me last time, but it is. Ah, I wonder if I told you the same thing first before I got to my answer that Kurt Brownholer, a fantastic comedian, uh, so funny, did hire uh, a skywriter once to write in the sky, how do I land? <laughs> and I think that's such a funny thing and he i believe he named one of his comedy albums how do i land and the the image is the the cover art but uh this is all to say <laughs> so i think i feel like that's one of the best jokes that uh that a person could do with skywriting i <laughs> i love uh, so another a future show that i'm working on uh about is about my grandmother who died uh, a couple years ago at age 91 mm. and i've been sharing loving sharing jokes about her and just the specific funny things that she said in my uh in my set and i think uh 
I, I here's a, a thing that she had uh she had a i forget if this was like a hanging on the wall or just like a some somehow adorning her condo in florida where she lived for the last decades of her life when you come in one of the first things you see is a, a sign that says be nice or get out and <laughs> I think that I think that that is a thing that I would I would love to share in skywriting uh, for uh, multiple reasons. Number one, to honor and remember my grandmother. May her memory be a blessing. Number two, uh, I think it's funny that I mean, I think it's like a joke because I mean, whoever came up with it, good work, be nice or get (laughs) out because uh, it's fun. I mean, it, it works on multiple levels because get out isn't a very nice thing to say, but totally. if you're not being nice, like then, I mean, I think it's nice to be nice to people even when they're not nice, but uh, I do understand the idea of telling a person who's not nice to get out in a not nice way, uh, in a way that <laughs> reminds me of my grandmother uh, and I think is really funny. And number three, I think it would be really funny to have be nice or get out written in the sky, which is outside. So it's like if people see it, they're like, where am I supposed to get out of? Get out of the out. (laughs) That means go in. I mean, let's let's. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, be nice or go in. There you go. That works. Oh, see there. There another another truism for all of us to think about. Mike, thank you so much for joining me on the show. I appreciate very much you taking the time. And let us close before we start yet another conversation. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Creative Solutions Podcast. I have been speaking with the fantastic Mike Kaplan. Go find his stuff. Having seen him live, I can honestly say, go see him live too. That's He's hilarious. And as always, I remind you to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2023. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Although, we can always hope. Until next time, keep living what you believe in.